Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our privacy deep dive about the future of liberty and security. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. Uh, the National Constitution Center is a wonderful place. It is the only place in America that brings together citizens of all perspectives to learn about, debate, and educate themselves about the US Constitution. And it is hard to imagine a constitutional issue more salient and urgent in America today than the balance between privacy and security. From the San Bernardino shootings, which led to a dramatic face-off between the government and Apple, to the Orlando shootings, where the perpetrator posted on Facebook of his intent uh, and his call for further attacks, to recent pressure on Twitter, Google, and Facebook to remove more terrorist speech online, we are debating exactly how to draw the line between privacy and security, and what sort of takedowns of terrorist speech the First Amendment allows, and what sort of seizure of data stored abroad and in the digital cloud does the Fourth Amendment permit? Remember, just a bit of review, the Fourth Amendment to the US Constitution says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And the First Amendment has been interpreted in the United States to allow for the suppression of very little truthful but embarrassing speech. Our free speech tradition says that speech can only be banned by the government if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That principle, adopted by the Supreme Court in the 1960s, sets us apart from the rest of the world, from Europe, which allows the suppression of hate speech to a much greater degree than we do. So we have a lot to discuss. We have an absolutely blockbuster, spectacular lineup for you. And we're going to begin with two people who may have more power over who can speak and who can be heard online uh, than any king or president or Supreme Court justice. I'm smiling because this I joke uh, whenever I introduce uh, Monica Bickert of Facebook, the head of global public policy at Facebook, who's been here at Aspen before, I say that she has more power than any king or president or Supreme Court justice because who can speak and who can be heard today is determined more by the decisions that Facebook makes than by the Supreme Court or the US government. And but I never always jump in and tell them it's a little more nuanced than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can try to deny it, but you know, power is difficult and we have to just uh, own it. Uh, the US government, however, does have substantial power over speech and privacy, and we have no better representative of the US government to join us than John Carlin, the Assistant Attorney General at the Justice Department in charge of national security. Both of these two people are extraordinarily accomplished public servants. Both Harvard Law School graduates, I think, near each other uh, uh, at Harvard around the same time. Uh, Monica, a former prosecutor. So they really understand these issues better than anyone, and I can't wait for this conversation. John, I'm going to jump right in and ask you to tell us what kind of online terrorist speech does the government, in fact, prosecute? So uh, thanks, Jeff. And maybe I'll start a little bit by just framing out what we're seeing and why this is an, such an important topic uh, for those of us who are fighting the terrorist threat. In the United States and worldwide, we're facing a terrorist threat that we simply haven't seen before. The Islamic State and the Levant deliberately adopted a new strategy in around 2013, 2014. And if you think of Al-Qaeda in some respects, Al-Qaeda wanted to carefully train and vet operatives, and they wanted to commit large-scale spectacular attacks that caused the maximum amount of death and destruction. And to be clear, they are still uh, plotting and planning these large-scale attacks. In order to do their attacks, they would vet operatives carefully. It often required traveling over into the Fatah at the time, Pakistan or Afghanistan, they would train people for years, and they cared deeply about their brand, if you will. So if there was going to be an Al-Qaeda attack, it was one that they had authorized and directed. What we saw with the switch to the Islamic State in the Levant is essentially they tried to crowdsource terrorism. Just as Al-Qaeda had used Western innovation technology against us when it came to aviation, we saw the Islamic State in the Levant exploiting a new phenomenon, social media, in a way that hadn't been exploited before. 
So when they crowdsourced terrorism, uh, they did two things. First, they called for people to, to join them as adherents, as foreign terrorist fighters. And the propaganda that they used was incredibly slick. I've talked with uh, folks in the advertising industry, not my uh, background or expertise, but they say the product that they were putting out is akin to what you would see put out by the, the highest paid advertisers in the United States. And they put out propaganda that it's not that they put out just the beheading uh, videos or putting out uh, uh, atrocities like watching someone be burned alive, which they do. That's not how they recruit, though. When they're recruiting, they put out this barrage of images that include things like a Islamic State in the Levant uh, terrorist, and the terrorist is literally handing out cotton candy to children, and that's what life in the Levant is going to look like. Or another one, because everybody knows on the internet, kitten cell. They have a terrorist with an AK-47 in one hand and a kitten uh, in the other hand. And that's what they use to try to get people to click and join. And then once they have them on the hook, they try to uh, walk them through the path of radicalization so that they go and join them as foreign terrorists over, uh, overseas. And as we know, what they actually do there, it's not kittens and cotton candy. What they're doing is they use rape uh, routinely as a political tool in a way we haven't seen before. They sell uh, women and children into slavery, and they murder Muslims and non-Muslims alike with impunity. What we're seeing in terms of here in the United States that we haven't seen before, last year we brought more terrorism cases related to international terrorism cases than we have, period, since uh, September 11th, over 60 cases. In addition to this call to join as foreign terrorist fighters, as we got better at disrupting, and we have an obligation to keep our citizens from going to commit those atrocities overseas. We have an obligation to keep them from learning skills, coming back here to do skilled uh, attacks inside the United States. What they switched as we got better at disrupting that flow, and they called upon uh, all of their adherents, kill where you live. It doesn't matter where you are, hit soft targets, kill civilians. And they just put this message out again and again, day after day. That uh, we saw that change in terms of the cases that we were bringing. And in America, unlike some of our closest foreign partners, thankfully we don't have the problem where it's all confined, it's, it's not uh, to one geographic region or ethnic group. Instead, we've brought cases across 30 different U.S. attorney's offices to date, reflecting the spread of the uh, threat. And the only common thread across all of them really is are two things. One, the age of the defendants. Over half our cases, they're 25 or under. One third, 21 or under. And that's new. That's simply not what a terrorist looked like five, 10 years ago. Linked to that is social media. The, the fact that they're exploiting social media, and in almost every case, there's a linkage to how the person got radicalized or how they got operational direction that came through social media. That's why uh, this is such an important uh, topic for us to address now. Tactically, I think it was uh, great work by law enforcement, prosecutors across the country to bring those uh, 60 cases or over 90 since this threat has developed. That's tactical success, though. Strategically, it's failure, in my mind, if we continue to have to arrest 21 and unders at that rate. And so we need to figure out a way to prevent them from doing the recruitment in the first place. And that means, one, defeating them where they are overseas, uh, but secondly, it means trying to figure out a way to work with the private sector minds who developed much of this technology to see if there are things we can do to keep these international terrorists located overseas from targeting our children here and trying to walk them down this path to radicalization. Thanks for that fascinating and sobering introduction to the subject. J just give us an example, before I turn to Monica, of a prosecution for someone who says something online but hasn't yet committed the act? What, what's an imminent threat? And as you uh, laid out succinctly, Jeff, so in, in, uh, in the United States, we don't prosecute people essentially for talking the talk. You have to see that they've taken a step to walk the walk. We have done a case that involves uh, solicitation, and I'll give you a little bit of the uh, fact pattern. Actually, there have been uh, two to date. So, this would be where the Islamic State in the Levant will sometimes obtain, and we have a case where they did this through hacking. So they, went into, they go into companies and elsewhere, they steal personally identifiable information, names of government employees, names of soldiers, names of police officers, and they get their addresses. Then they post that uh, through Twitter, through other means of social uh, media, and they say, here's our kill list. Kill these people where they are. And so we've brought cases 
against individuals in the United States who that original content came from the terrorist overseas who put the kill list on, and then the person here pushed that list out with a call to kill those individuals where they lived, and so that we've prosecuted. Many of the other prosecutions, which we can talk about a little bit, involve uh, undercover operations where you, you push, you see if someone who's talking the talk will do that step, take that operational step to commit the act or to kill someone here, and then that, that combination will be the basis of the charge. Fascinating. Okay, so John has set things up very well. You understand that in America, you can only prosecute someone if they take a list saying, kill these people and circulate that list, and that list has an imminent uh, danger of actually being followed through on. Monica, uh, because of your extraordinary power, uh, Facebook is not uh, the government. It is not constrained by the First or Fourth Amendment. And you are able to adopt po policy guidelines uh, that are slightly different from the US government's. What is your standard for the kind of terrorist speech that you take down? And I'm joking, but because you have this incredible responsibility, uh, since almost all terrorist attacks seem to take place uh, on Facebook or they're described on Facebook, what's the sort of speech you take down? How effective are the takedowns? And what are the standards that you're using? Sure. Um, and I should start off by saying that uh, our, like you said, we are not bound by the First Amendment. And so our standards for speech are uh, tied towards giving the safety, giving our community the feeling of safety and also making sure that they actually are safe. So those are the two guiding principles as we think about what is OK on Facebook. We don't allow any speech that supports terrorism or terrorists. And we also don't allow any member of a terror organization to have a presence on Facebook, period. So even if uh, the leader of Boko Haram were to create a Facebook page or a Facebook account and do nothing but talk about kittens or uh, whatever else, that would not be OK. And we would remove that account as soon as we become aware of it. There are some, challenge, some challenges that we face. Uh, for one thing, at our scale, we've got 1.65 billion people using Facebook regularly in countries all over the world. About four out of every five people using Facebook are outside the United States. So we're talking about dozens of languages and uh, many different cultures and ways of, of thinking about what's OK to discuss and what's, to, what's OK to share online. But we also have a very strong team of people who are reviewing content that is reported to us. So um, anytime that you're on Facebook, if you see something that you think supports terrorism or something that appears to be by a member of a terror, organiza terror organization, you can always click on the upper right-hand corner. You can report it to us. And then we have people who look at it. And these are people who speak dozens of languages that are sitting in offices around the world. And they will review that very promptly, and they will remove it, and also send it to our legal team so that if it warrants referral to law enforcement, and that's something that our terms permit us to do, and, and um, we will do. Uh, fascinating. And uh, some commentators have called for you to suppress more speech online. We had a great debate at the National Constitution Center with you and Eric Posner of the University of Chicago. And Eric Posner said, you should ban speech that glorifies terrorism, not just that uh, promotes hate. Uh, what, what do you think about those proposals? We do, in fact. So you, can't, you cannot praise a terror act. If somebody were to say about the horrific attack in Orlando, um, that was great, that would be absolutely removed. If somebody were to mock a victim of an attack, that also would be removed. Now, I, I want to be. Uh, I want to be mindful of the fact that the way social media and other communication services work, we have billions of posts every day on Facebook and billions of photos being uploaded every day on Facebook. So this is a very large community. And we do rely heavily on our community to tell us when they are seeing something that violates our policies. But anything like that would be removed. And you know, you mentioned earlier, um, well, I think, I think uh, you said that terror attacks tend to be discussed on Facebook. This is a place where people will come to discuss the world around them. That's a good thing. And the vast majority of the 1.65 billion people using Facebook are using it for good purposes. And if they are using it to raise awareness about atrocities that are happening in the world, that's awesome. We welcome that. Where we draw the line is if they start to glorify or celebrate violent acts or violent actors. 
I, um, uh, John, you gave a speech at GW recently where you talked about how important it is for the U.S. government to cooperate with uh, social media. You said, uh, you talked about the crowdsourcing of terrorism on PBS, and you say that the companies, the platforms, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, are being exploited by terrorists. I think there's a recognition now there's a problem. We're starting to see people at the companies address additional resources, but more needs to be done because we're still seeing the threat, and the threat is increasing, not decreasing. What more needs to be done, and how can Monica help you better? So I think there's, there's a couple of things uh, we need to work on. One thing that, uh, that we should and are uh, focusing on now is, okay, we know that the international ter terrorist groups overseas, and these are designated terrorist groups overseas, have a strategy where they want to exploit social media by pushing this propaganda out to reach uh, audience members, to encourage them to commit terrorist attacks, to encourage them to join them overseas to commit terrorist attacks. And so one method is ensuring uh, that, as, as Monica was saying, that these are safe places. So if my kids, and our, uh, for all, all of us that have kids, they're all on uh, social uh, media now. If they're using those sites, we need to educate, make sure that parents know. Because um, I don't think, when it comes to being uh, someone trying to groom your child in the community, you'd be aware to the signs that there's a, uh, someone who's trying to walk them down this path of radicalization to commit a terrorist act. When it's happening in the basement, um, and they're just on online social media. I don't think uh, for a period of time people were aware that this is one of the dangers that you have to figure out how to talk with your child about and prevent them from reaching. Secondly is to keep them from using the platforms when the terms of service of the platform prohibit them from using it in this manner. And that for us in government, that means continually educating and informing as to where we see the threat changing, because this is a group that's uh, quite adaptive as terrorist groups are, and so as we get good at stopping one method that they're using, they're going to try to use another, so to do that educational function. A third, and that takes resources, and what I, the trend that I think we're seeing now is more resources being put in by the companies that provide the platform, because it is, can be resource intensive to figure out what does or doesn't violate their uh, terms of service, and you saw companies put a lot of resources and time when it came to child predators exploiting their services in order to groom and have uh, uh, try to commit sexual violence against children or uh, groom them into uh, child sexual por pornography. We need to have that same dedicated resource attention to those who are trying to groom children to be terrorists. The last, and this is something where it sure is not the expertise of career uh, prosecutors or national security folks, but, and it's why one reason I wanted to be at Aspen Ideas this year is we need to figure out alternative messages that are appealing. And this is a war of words I, I believe we ought to be able to win. Again, we ought to be able to convince people that the rape, slavery, murder path is not desirable, but that there are other ways uh, to go. And I'm, I'm confident with the best creative minds that we can. So we tried to convene a group where we walked through what the threat was at Justice and uh, with uh, other counterterrorism professionals from across the community said, here's what we're seeing. And then we called upon advertisers, movie directors, uh, those in the social media industry, and said, essentially, that's the threat. If you use that same creative power you have in other spaces, and on your own, so it's not directed government speech, come up with alternative messages that are, uh, that are appealing. Great. Monica, I know you care a lot about these issues. You do talk to DOJ. What do you think about John's call for greater resources? And tell us also about what Facebook is already doing to support counter speech that might change hearts and minds of kids. This is an area of, of tremendous investment for not only us, but others in the industry. And uh, frankly, when it comes to Facebook, that's been true for years. The policies that I mentioned against support of terrorism are not new. I've been in this position for three years. Those policies were there before I came into the job. But as we've grown as a company, and as the, the terrorism threat has continued to evolve, it has been something that we've continued to invest in. So in the past two years, we have trained hundreds of civil society groups in the best ways to engage in speech against extremism on social media. I'll tell you just about a, a couple of those projects because actually, as you know, I love to talk about these. These are actually, um, they're fun and they're, they're meaningful because although it's easy for anybody to say, oh, well, social media, that's an essential component in radicalization. In fact, the research, uh, the research points to a lot of offline sources of radicalization. And if, if people are interested in that, I would point them to um, 
the Jihad Trending Report by Quilliam Foundation, which it came out a, a couple years ago, but what it does nicely is it walks through different factors that are often present in radicalization. And uh, one thing that you see is that people are often radicalized through direct personal connections, and that includes uh, conversations that they have with those in their neighborhood, friends in their universities or their schools, in prisons, in religious institutions, in community centers. And uh, if you can just pretend for a moment that not just Facebook, but every social media company could be absolutely perfect at recognizing and removing any terrorist propaganda immediately. So sort of imagine that for a second. And then also imagine that the thousands, literally thousands of websites, gaming platforms, and any other messaging service online had the, a similar magical capability of uh, removing any pro-terrorist speech. That wouldn't fix the problem. We had terrorism before social media. Uh, we're going to continue to have recruitment. And so you have to do something more than that. We will, of course, as an industry, take our responsibility seriously in, in terms of removing that content, um, which is why I'm happy to say that although some of the companies, you may think of them as competitors, uh, when it comes to this issue, we meet regularly as an industry. We have an industry working group. We talk very candidly about the best way to keep our services safe from the threat of terrorism or radicalization. And we also talk about ways we can help people use our services to spread positive messages and to get people to really start to think critically about these ideologies. Like John said, there's gotta be a better way than if, if you are a youth and you are struggling, there is a better path than becoming a rapist for ISIS. Um, so a couple of these projects we've been doing, uh, one is we've been, we've been working with Affinis Global Labs, which is an organization that sponsors competitive hackathons where they bring together experts in all different areas. Somebody might be a creative designer, somebody is a social media expert, somebody else is, a, is an expert in uh, preventing extremism or radicalization, and they put these people on teams, and over the course of 36 hours, they come up with a platform or a campaign to counter extremism. We provide training at the beginning of that, uh, and that training is based on some research that we've been doing for the past two years to understand concretely what kinds of posts against extremism tend to succeed? We've been doing that with a think tank called Demos, and if you're interested, you can look at Google Demos study and, and, um, and Facebook, and, and you'll find the links for it. But um, what we have been finding is that there are certain types of tones, if you are positive in tone, if you use humor and satire, that are more likely to reach audiences, and there are certain types of formats that are likely to reach audiences. So we teach this at these hackathons, and then at the end of the 36 hours, these teams come up and they pitch in a sort of a, it's, it's almost like this, it's kind of a um, live audience, shark tank feeling kind of session that has funders in it. They pitch these ideas and then these, these platforms and, and campaigns go off and, and um, take flight, which is really neat. The other program that I'll mention is uh, one that we just, we've, we've been investing in more and more, which is called the Peer to Peer program sponsored by AdVenture Partners and Facebook and the U.S. State Department. And uh, the program basically has created a university curriculum that for one semester teaches students how to create a campaign against extremism. The students in their class create a unique campaign, they launch it, they uh, have metrics for tracking their success, how many people are they reaching and, and what sorts of evidence are they seeing that their campaign is working, then they submit it for judging to adventure partners, and then at the end of the semester, we bring them together, and uh, we select the top six finalists. They come to Washington, D.C., they present their ideas, and we, the winners are picked and scholarships are awarded, and it's, it's just, it's amazing to see what they come up with. We had that earlier this week. Uh, one of the winning teams was from Afghanistan. Um, one was from um, Utrecht in the Netherlands, and they are approaching this same issue. How do we reach the team in Afghanistan their project was, how do we reach religious students and youth imams who are going to have a lot of sway over young people who might be tempted by extremism? And how do we actually get them to understand that our religion as Afghans and the way that, that, um, that we live our lives must be against extremism? That's the only way to be true to our religion. So uh, 
in addition to blood drives and textbooks and all different things they created, they also had a, an online campaign through which they reached five million people uh, throughout Afghanistan. So, so really some wonderful results. Those are great examples of counter speech. They are indeed inspiring. And counter speech is very much in the tradition of my hero, Louis Brandeis. I've just written a book about Brandeis that I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. Go buy it at the Aspen Bookstore. But this is the greatest theorist of free speech in the 20th century who says that the best remedy for evil counsels is good ones because he has so much faith in reason. As long as there's time enough to deliberate, he says, you have to allow even the most hateful speech so that citizens have access to all arguments so they can make up their own minds. John, was Brandeis right, or do you think that Facebook should, in fact, restrict even more terrorist speech online? Uh, if so, what should the standards be? Um, or is another approach more effective than suppressing speech? Well, I think you've heard Monica lay through that it is a violation of Facebook's existing policies to, uh, to endorse um, terrorism. So. You have to do both, and I think what's a little bit different when it comes to social media can be these echo chambers that develop where, um, particularly if you're younger, you can end up uh, exploring and then in a part of the uh, internet or space where you're only hearing one message. And so what makes it difficult is how do you penetrate into that echo chamber to get the other message in there, and then, and this will not be, again, our expertise, because one thing I've heard from every one of these experts is if it comes from someone in government, it's dead on arrival. If you're trying to reach this, this particular group, which is what is that, that message that you can inject uh, into, that, into that space. Another, uh, and we're, uh, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the hackathon, this type of creative idea, it, it's exciting to see, and we just hope that we start seeing it. Because for me, the measure is I'm not see we're not bringing as many cases, because there aren't as many people who are would be uh, terrorists, and secondly, we stopped seeing the devastating attacks and having to comfort families because we were unable to prevent an attack from occurring. That, that's what success is going to look at, and I believe we need to use the creativity. You think about these services, they didn't exist at 10, 15. We, we can create amazing things uh, together. Surely we can beat this problem, and so we've not succeeded until we've uh, decreased the terrorism threat from, from where it is from where it is now. There's one thing I want to mention, because you said hackathon, which is uh, with this group as well, because there's a blend now between, which is another area where we need company uh, cooper cooperation, which is those who are attacked by cyber uh, actors who steal information. I just want to talk about one case. Most companies today, if they saw a relatively unsophisticated hack into their system, and they see someone stealing a small amount of personally identifiable information, names, addresses, and then they get a threat that says, give me 500 bucks through Bitcoin, or I'm going to embarrass you by releasing the information. Most companies around the world pay the 500 bucks. And so I do want to tell the story of one individual named Farizi, where if a company had done that, unbeknownst to them, they wouldn't have been paying off a low-level criminal. Farizi was actually a Kosovo extremist located in Malaysia in a conspiracy. And what he was doing is he, they were making a buck, but they also were taking that stolen information and, providing it to one of the most notorious cyber terrorists in the world at the time, a British citizen named Junaid Hussein, who was living at the heart of the Islamic State of the Levant in uh, Raqqa, Syria. And he was using that to create these kill lists and then pushing it back to US audiences through Twitter with a specific call to kill them. So, so no company, I think, would deliberately pay off that terrorist group in order to have, help fund uh, killing people. But because when you're a company, you don't know if you don't talk to the government, who's on the other end of that hack? If you try to handle it alone, that's what can happen. In this case, we were worked with the company, and um, Farizi was arrested in Malaysia pursuant to US criminal process and pled guilty recently in the Eastern District of, Vir of Virginia. Junaid Hussein was killed in a military strike by, uh, by CENTCOM. That gives you, though, I think, a, a sense of, this is a really complicated threat that we're facing now. It moves very quickly through internet means. It has people working together across countries on the terrorist side of the equation. It cuts across multiple nationalities. And to beat it, we have to work together, not just with other governments, and not just within our own government, but it requires working very closely with the private sector. 
Well, that is great. Uh, the one rule of this deep dive is we're going to have to uh, enforce the time limit, so we're going to stop. But what I love about this conversation is the note of optimism on which you ended. This is the most urgent of all problems, and yet you and Monica both talked about cooperation between the platforms and the government using counter speech, using effective law enforcement, rather than just suppressing speech by itself that can, in fact, save lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Monica Bickert and John Carlin. Can I? Um, can you, there's a CNN feed that is going continuously. Is there some TV oh. thing? Is, is it? I think it's coming from here. But oh, can you, you ask can the? Hear it? I can hear it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. You, you can. Great. Wonderful. I am. I've just asked them to turn it down or off or something like that. Not yet. Oh, oh good. Uh, actually, please, yes, come on. <laughs> Sorry. Absolutely. So, as you do the final tech, if you can also try to address this loud noise, uh, then that would be great. There's a CNN feed that's going on. Hi. Uh, wonderful. As we sort out the uh, technology for uh, this next panel, uh, I am thrilled to introduce our Phenomenal moderator, uh, Rich Wilhelm and I, I think first appeared at an Aspen panel about WikiLeaks more than a decade ago. My gosh, how the world has... No, I think it was only five years Maybe ago. it was five. Yeah, that must have been it. It couldn't have been a decade. I don't think WikiLeaks was out 10 years ago. But it was an amazing panel, and the world is very different. And now we're talking about questions involving encryption and the conditions under which the government should have access to encrypted data. And there's no one better to lead this phenomenal discussion than our superb moderator. Rich Wilhelm is former senior policy advisor on Al Gore's national security staff and senior intelligence official in the Clinton administration. He recently retired as a Booz Allen executive vice president. Please join me in welcoming Rich Wilhelm. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll go ahead and get started while the others are getting uh, mic'd up and introduce them. But I think the contours of the argument um, are fairly clear. And the most recent, let's say, use case is the Apple case where, uh, as you, I'm sure, have read, Apple and other members of the tech, uh, the tech community are involved in um, uh, installing unbreakable encryption. Even they can't break the encryption back. Uh, and, um, you know, Mike Bloomberg, uh, uh, there are two sides of that argument. Uh, the government would say that uh, in the long run that's dangerous, uh, that uh, terrorists and criminals uh, use those devices as well. Mike Bloomberg this morning in the, um, in the Wall Street Journal, I think, uh, makes a very good case for the government's case, say that, uh, and, and I quote in part, he says, uh, the prospect of criminals and terrorists communicating with phones beyond the reach of government search warrants should sh send a shiver down the spine of every citizen. The other side of that argument, and we have uh, uh, lots of people on this panel that can address that, is that um, uh, you know this is uh, another step in the road to uh, a mass surveillance state, uh, that uh, privacy is being uh, uh, given away step by step over a period of time, and some would even argue uh, that, um, that uh, we're already there. Uh, we have a, a great panel to address that this morning. Uh, let me introduce them. Uh, to my right, uh, Julia, uh, Julia Angen, An Anguin. She's an investigative journalist and senior reporter for uh, ProPublica. She's written extensively on this. Uh, and she spent many years uh, at the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, writing about this and other issues and published a book about how, uh, among other things, how difficult it is to remain uh, anonymous in, uh, in, in, in the information age. Uh, to her right is Josephine Wolfe. Uh, she's an academic, an assistant professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology and a faculty associate at the Harvard's uh, Beckman's, uh, Beckman Berkman Center for Internet uh, and Society. Um, uh, next is Morgan uh, Marquis-Bois. He's the director of security at 
uh, First Look Media. Uh, she, he's a self-described uh, hacker and security engineer, and, a, uh, and, and in fact is a former security engineer at, um, at Google. And finally, Jane Hole Lute, uh, she's currently the Special Coordinator on Sexual Exploitation and Abuse at the UN. She's had many jobs at the UN throughout her career. Uh, perhaps more relevant to this discussion, she's a former Deputy Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and a former uh, Chief Executive Officer uh, at the Center uh, for Internet Security. Uh, I'd like to uh, open the discussion, if I might, uh, by uh, asking Jane, uh, the government has made its case. Uh, is that crazy talk, or is it overblown, or does the government have a point at some level? Well, well, we'll know a lot more after this half hour of conversation, I think. <laughs> um, I, I think the government's basic, basic point is, you know, we're not in a business as usual environment when it comes to terrorists. And so, you know, companies need to wake up and pay attention. And who in the world would deliberately impede legitimate law enforcement operating under rules in their effort to, to address the broader needs of society and, and security? One of the things I think governments have to confront, though, is that unlike physical space, where governments are used to being the monopolists on security, I mean, typically security is something societies assign to governments to handle. You know, we want safe streets. Governments, you run the police. We want a safe country. Governments, you run the military. You make the laws. And so governments are used to being not only the big players, but really the monopolists in the security space. And the problem is they are not, by a very, very long shot, the monopolists or even the dominant players in cyberspace. Governments matter a lot for security in, in physical space because governments have legitimated control over the power to protect us. But it's not the power to protect us that matters in cyberspace, it's the power to connect us. And that's the power that matters. And that's why governments are struggling everywhere to find a role and to play it effectively. Another point of view, Morgan? Yeah, so I, 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 I would actually agree that, you know, I, I think that people probably wouldn't want to impede legitimate law enforcement you know, investigations. Uh, um, however, I think that a lot of the language and a lot of the rhetoric that's being used primarily around the Apple sort of FBI case and around the language of encryption and things that Silicon Valley needs to do or not do um, isn't, it, it is either, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's illegitimate, but there is definite a, definitely a, a, a trust has been breached um, for instance, a lot of the dialogue around this, I, I would describe as fear-mongering, actually, because we're, we're all, all so very worried that you know, this unbreakable encryption could be used by terrorists and so forth. Um, and, and today, there was actually an article about the wiretap statistics that were released last year. And it actually showed that criminals are using less encryption, not more. So last year, of the you know, close to 5,000 law enforcement requests that were made, um, less than a quarter of a percent of those wiretap requests actually encountered encrypted data that they could not, um, could not access. And so there's this, there's this very powerful sort of surging rhetoric um, surrounding this, this debate. In fact, I mean, the FBI didn't actually need Apple to get into this phone. They were trying to make a point. Um, However, this, this whole... Well, they're continuing to try to make a point. They're continuing to try to make a point, but a lot of the going dark rhetoric, I think, is, an, is actually false. Um, like, a lot of the, the sort of leaked documents that are from, from the NSA have sort of revealed to us that we live in a golden age of surveillance. Rather than going dark, there's, in fact, greater surveillance capability than we've ever had. So I, I just I wonder why we're, we're so obsessed with forcing companies to subvert the security of American-made products. Well, I think, I think there's maybe even some value to trying to clarify those rules, right? You brought up most Americans don't want to impede law enforcement from doing their jobs following the set of rules that are in place. And I think one of the things that's different about the security rules governing digital data is that they're much less clear to a lot of people than they are around, say, warrants for physical search and seizure. So I think there's value to the FBI and to the rest of us in pushing this to try and say, even if they're not going to win, is this allowed, right? Are we allowed to, right? The fact that that's still so ambiguous, what the rules are and aren't under current law, I think, is sort of a problem for people because it means that they don't know what the rules are governing law enforcement, what they can and can't expect. 
Julia, um, what's your take on this? Is, 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 is the government request going too far? I mean, I think that there's a false dichotomy between choosing security and choosing privacy. And the debate around Apple encryption was framed, well, do you want to choose to be safe or do you want to choose, you know, to be unsafe? And then if you choose unsafe, you can have encryption. And I think that that's just, I don't think there's actually evidence for this, for these two things to be in conflict at all. Um, the truth is that we would be entirely vulnerable as a nation to all sorts of bad actors if we didn't encrypt our data. And in fact, right now, we're probably um, much, much less encrypted than we should be, right? There's no institution that hasn't failed us in terms of protecting our data, whether it's a Target or the IRS or the <laughs> OPM, which lost the background check records for three million public uh, servants. Um, so all of our institutions are failing us at providing defense and then we're supposed to give them more offense capability. But in fact, we all would be better off if our data was secure. And so this weird idea that, well, you have to get your data less secure to help catch a guy who's actually already dead. Um, <laughs> and you're going to find out a little bit more on his phone, I suppose, but it wasn't going to prevent that attack. But, but Julia, no one, I don't think the government is arguing that data shouldn't be encrypted. I well, think. they're saying the, the encryption should be weak enough that they can look into it, which is basically uh, a lot of technologists would tell you that's not encryption. Right? You no, know, but I think I, you both made real, I mean, all three of my colleagues have made really important points. It's hard to find principle here. I mean, it's hard to know what to do. I mean, on the one hand, companies from Silicon Valley, um, which is, you know, where some of them have an address, I mean, but they're all pervasive now globally, I mean, which, with considerable power that we have to come to grips with, you know, on the one hand, they're very strong advocates for the protection of individuals online through privacy and the protections and encryption. On the other hand, um, it is way too difficult to secure yourself in cyberspace right now. Overwhelmingly, offense wins. Overwhelmingly. And there are four things every enterprise could do at relatively low cost, at the sysadmin, that is to say non-specialist level, and they're not doing it. And the companies are not promoting basic cyber hygiene that would do an enormous amount to protect us from 80 to 90% of the things that are going wrong today. So it's very true. I agree absolutely. People, how, people can be forgiven for not knowing what to do. I mean, they discover a major security move when they learn that Mark Zuckerberg covers the camera on his laptop computer. <laughs> I mean, I walk around, everybody I know, I'm putting you know, sticky notes on people's cameras. But I mean, this is not OK. If companies want to have a principled position, and if government wants to have a principled position on security, we ought to begin with basic cyber hygiene and engage the public in the rules under which we are willing to make trade-offs of security for other benefits. How, how important is trust to all of this? I mean, not trust, I mean, trust in the government is very low, as you know, all around the world. I mean, we've seen this in the political system. Uh, and trust in this area is a big issue. But how important is trust? I mean, would this be easier if there were greater trust in the institutions of, of government? I do think that post Snowden, the idea that you're going to come out and say, OK, yeah, I'm sorry, we were running a secret program. Might have been unconstitutional to collect every American's phone call logs. <laughs> but don't worry. That was where we cleaned it up. And now, trust us, we need additional powers. Right? That's a hard argument to make, especially when, as you said, Government itself is not taking any measures to protect the data that it holds about Americans and about not its own none. employing. Not enough of them. And so, you know, they have, I think, lost their trust and they need to earn it back. And that is something that I don't see, right? The FBI is not actually out there promoting cyber hygiene. They're asking for additional powers. And so I think it's perfectly legitimate for everybody in America to look questionably at this request for additional power, given that we haven't had appropriate um, trust before, and we haven't had a public debate. When you think about wiretaps, it took about 40 years of jurisprudence and public policy debates to really get clear about when and under what circumstances would we allow something as invasive as listening to somebody's phone call. And we have incredible transparency and requirements around that. I'm not sure if you all know, but you don't need just a search warrant for a wiretap, you need a super warrant. You need to show that you have exhausted all other available possibilities. Now, the FBI is not asking for a super warrant to get into your iPhone, right? They're not asking, and the wire you have to have yearly reports how many wiretaps you did under what circumstances they're not suggesting they're going to do that so without those kinds of controls and audit procedures and 
um, public debate, I think we should all question whether this is a power to grant unconditionally. I'd like to say something to that because I, I so I actually worked at, at Google when the Snowden revelations came out. And one of the, the, the sort of PowerPoint presentations that was released showed how um, the Five Eyes was actually tapping Google. And there was, there was an amusing diagram sort of complete with a smiley face and that sort of thing. And you know, I was, as I was working there at the time and, and various colleagues of mine were, I mean, I'm not gonna swear on stage, but they were very unimpressed and wrote uncomplimentary public blog posts and, and, and so forth. Um, and so I think to say that there has been you know, a, a sort of a broken trust, that there is um, sort of a strained relationship between Silicon Valley and, and sort of government interest is, is, is very real, and I think it's, it's, it's sort of understandable. Um, I mean, when you have um, you know, intelligence uh, apparatus that in theory are supposed to be protecting sort of the lives, business interests, and, and so forth of you know, um, countries and their allies, and you find that they're actually sort of hacking your organization and stealing your data, um, you, you can see how that might lead to, you know, um, well, for a start, somewhat unexpected, um, but, but you could see how that could lead to a strained relationship. So, so you know, it, in some ways, I think when, you know, you get the FBI saying like, hey, you know, Silicon Valley really needs to come to the table, we've got this existential threat, it's a really big deal, it's like, Wait, 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 like two years ago, do you remember that thing where you hacked us and you stole our stuff? Like, yeah, we're sorry about that. I mean, we never actually apologized, but, I mean, so I think that, that that's something to bear in mind, right? But, I mean, do we have any uh, higher level of trust in um, Google or Apple or any of the tech community that has gobs and gobs and gobs of personnel information that they uh, are, in, you know, are in their repositories and they turn around and sell that to advertisers. Well, one of the things I think is complicated about that relationship as well is that Google and Facebook and so on need the trust not just of the people in the United States, but their customers all over the world, right. which is not usually a relationship that the United States government is as concerned about as they are with their own constituency. Right. And so I think a lot of this sort of hostility comes partly because people in the US become wary of their own government, but partly because those companies are looking around and saying, we need to be able to sell our products overseas as well. And this is the fact that the rest of the world doesn't trust us is also a huge issue, even if the United States government doesn't care as much about that. And I you know, guess I, also I would just add quickly that um, I do think that Google and Facebook have also lost our trust and they should also well, establish yeah. it, right, by constantly changing the privacy settings in ways that we can't ever really maintain control of our data. So, or understand. And this is a request, so my request for all these institutions to behave better is not limited to the government. <laughs> so I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, what, you know, what are you know, Google and Facebook and Apple known by in Europe? GAFA. <laughs> GAFA. You, have you heard this phrase? Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. They call it GAFA. Oh, Microsoft wow. must be very unhappy. Uh, there's a <laughs> I don't have to answer for that. Um, and, and there are real questions regarding what will they do with the power they have? And what are the rules under which they wield this power? I mean, and who are they ultimately answerable to, um, given the public effect that they're having? These are all legitimate questions. But I come back to this notion of trust because I think social trust in public sector institutions has collapsed worldwide. We don't trust banks, businesses, the media, markets, and we're very anxious and angry about it because I don't know that we know how to architect scalable, trusted institutions in public space. So when you think about what do they require? So, I mean, what do you expect of your government? Nobody interacts with government unless they have to, okay? So, at least in this country. So, what, what do we want? We want a clear value proposition, reliably delivered. And trust comes in with, a, with emotion when I, when I have reliance. So why is trust so shattered here? Because there's not an enterprise in the marketplace today that delivers value without relying on IT and access to the internet. So three questions. Question number one, how do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? Question number two, how do we ensure the integrity of our information and our identities in an open internet? And question number three, what will the role of government be? And so that's what's on offer now in this conversation about privacy and security and trust. I can tell you how to architect trust. 
we have an amazing model in this country for trust. It's called due process. What it means is that you get to have your day in court. You get to argue, and if your data is being used against you, you have rights. But it, whether that's by a private company or by the government. What's the problem with our current data climate is that we, there's no baseline standards for us to have any rights in any of these realms, right? The only model we have is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So by the way, you might not know this, this is the only data over which you have any due process rights. So we are allowed to dispute the underlying data and see the underlying data that is used to make our credit score because that is considered such an important score and that data is considered so important that we were granted those rights by President Richard Nixon, a great proponent of transparency. <laughs> um, and so I do think we should think about that. We have a working model where we get to see and dispute data that's used against us. We could have that for other things. And that's um, in the national security context, that's harder. But you can build due process into that as well, right? The no-fly list is a perfect example of not building due process into something that has real ramifications for people. You probably don't know this, but you can never find out why you were ever placed on the no-fly list, and even if you go to court, you'll never be told. And so there's no disputing and no winning in court for that, and that feels un-American, because due process is such a part of what we are stand for as a nation, or at least that's what I think. So I do think there's a way to architect trust, but the problem is it's not technical, it's legal. And so we all have to agree as a society, what are the legal standards we want to live by, and where, what is that going to look like? Following on to this argument a little bit, I'd like to provoke you a little bit. And Obviously, two hours that's easy to do. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Two hours ago, um, maybe three hours ago, Dave Petraeus noted in a previous um, panel that in years past, uh, the intelligence community and the government had quiet discussions with industry, and there was lots of cooperation there. In the aftermath of the Snowden revelations, that's become a very bipolar relationship. And he thinks the answer is not the courts, but he thinks the answer is to go back to those quiet discussions. Discuss amongst yourselves. So, and it, comment. so it, it is. It is again. This, it's important to to separate out that that is Dave's take from a national security perspective. From a homeland security perspective, the dialogue never ceased. The dialogue never right. ceased. You know, the intelligence community interacting with the American public. We hope it's kept in check, right, and operating under rules. I mean, the homeland security environment. There's interaction with the public every single day. Five to seven million people directly terabytes of information about the global movement of people and goods um, because people want to get on with their everyday lives. And we have a tension here. You know, on the one hand, we want to keep people who might be dangerous and things that might be dangerous, we want to keep them out. You know, but we also want to expedite legitimate trade and travel. We want to welcome those who enrich our culture, enrich our economy. You know, and it, and it does place a premium on information. And one of the things governments have come to grips with over the past dozen years only is that they no longer have the corner on the market on the control of information and that there's a vast wealth of it that exists in the private sector and it's time governments demonstrate they can respect that. I think the idea that what we need is to have more secrecy around how data is handled and collected is pretty fundamentally backwards. I mean, I'm willing to accept that there are conversations that need to happen in secret and that there's good reason for those conversations happening the way that they do. And I'm certainly willing to accept that it's much easier to come to consensus between companies and the government if nobody's ever going to know what you're agreeing to. But I don't think that necessarily means that that's the Doesn't best way trust. to make decisions right. for all circumstances and all kinds of data treatment. I, I, I have a... I, you know, I think it would be great if, if we could have due process and transparency. I, I wonder how realistic it is to expect that the business of intelligence and counterintelligence will be conducted in an open enough manner to restore that trust, simply because I mean, by nature of the thing itself, uh, you know, spying is a clandestine activity. Um, and so, I mean, I, 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 I would love to see this sort of trust restored. I think that you know, the, the intelligence apparatus plays sort of an essential you know, role in you know, sort of the, the safety of the nation state and that sort of thing. But, but yeah, I, I really, I mean, I, I have been racking my brain actually as to, because, you know, we, we had this discussion before the panel, like, you know, well, how, how would you fix things? Um, and, you know, I, I, I think about this and I, I actually really wonder because, um, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, national security gets its own court, right? Um, and now, obviously, you know, when, revelations about some of the interpretations of the Constitution came, became public, some people were less than impressed. 
on how this court had actually been interpreting American law. Um, however, I can't say I'm surprised that this was the path taken, and I would actually be very, very surprised if it was like, okay, well, we really need to fix this broken trust, so we're going to make all of this clandestine activity public. I'm like, is that... I, I uh, that's probably unrealistic, but I think, uh, you know, I think there is some... I mean, Jane and I were talking about this earlier. I think that... I, 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 I think that there's probably a little too much secrecy. I mean, where that line is, I think that it can be uh, more open. But um, Craig Mundy wrote an article in uh, Foreign Affairs uh, two years ago in which he said essentially the bottom line, uh, and he called it pragmatic privacy. And what he said was, Listen, stop focusing the discussion on collection. Collection is out of the bag, it's inevitable, everybody is doing it, that the discussion should focus on data use. And that is really, who should have access to these data, under what circumstances, with what sort of control regime? Um, does that begin, I mean, if, if the discussion focuses less on collection and more on how people, how organizations, how entities get access to it, does that begin walking us down the road? I think he's making my due process argument, sort of. Right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not willing to sort of say, you know, let's just sort of wave our hands, you know, put out the trembling hand on collection. You know, it's over. Everybody can right. do whatever they want to do. I'm not willing to say that. Right. What data are you collecting? For what purpose? With whom will you share it? Under what rules? How will you safeguard it? And how will you destroy it after what period of time? So I'm, I, you know, we can... You know, we can get to this conversation about pragmatic privacy, but, but I don't think we ought to give ground on sort of saying, oh, you know what, it's really too hard, so we're not going to worry about it. Especially because, as Julia said, none of these organizations are very confident in their ability to control access to this data. So just because you said we've collected it all, but we're only going to use it for these very specific things doesn't mean that you can actually necessarily follow through on making sure that that will be the case. Right. There's that... Yeah. And, and by the way, self-described. I would never self-describe myself as a hacker. But there is an old... <laughs> yeah, I, just, I, just, I took umbrage with that when you said it, so I thought I'd bring it up now, because there's an old hacker adage, you know, the sort of information wants to be free, right? right. Um, which, which sort of does play into this, is that if, if you collect it, you know, and, unless you're keeping it in a steel trap underground, the chances that someone else can get at that information is actually very real. So I think that, that does, you know, I'm, I'm with you on this. I don't think that we should sort of wave the trembling hand on bulk collection and just be like, well, it's just happening. So, you know, I'm like... I, I think we should consider a little the social consequences of that occurring. Um, I think if, you know, I, I think that the, the internet has become, you know, sort of an integral part in the day-to-day -day lives of billions of people. Um, it is sort of how the majority of communication and commerce occurs. Um, and so just accepting that all of my activities on it are, are tracked and available for perusal, I think that has definite real consequences for how democracy operates. And I think just sort of giving that away in a, in a hand wave is, is, is actually terrifying to me. And, and, okay. I, and I think, you know, many sins have been com committed in the name of pragmatism, just being pragmatic here. <laughs> right. No, really. I mean, I want to come back to this point about secrecy because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, if we haven't learned anything in the past half dozen years, it's that secrecy doesn't scale. But we've equally learned at the same time that security must scale in ways that we can all live with ourselves over. And there are important tensions to resolve. And so conversations like this, if due process is the answer, and I, I've been thinking about it since you mentioned it, it is, it is you know, it's at the heart of what we, we basically want to say. You know, very powerful social norms, inclusivity, nothing about me without me. Transparency, what's going on, does it concern me, I'll decide. Reciprocity, if I'm going to be required to do this, is everyone else required to do this as well? And accountability, who will answer for what happened or what failed to happen under these circumstances? That's what really part right. of the conversation we're going to We're going to run out of time here. I'd like to have a lightning round, starting with you, Julia. If there were one thing, if you were in charge of the world, if there were one thing you could do to get us started back on the road to fixing this issue, what would it be? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, okay, I guess what I would do is I would go for some low-hanging fruit. So even though I want due process, I would probably um, go for data breach fines. Right now, there's literally, you don't have to pay anything if you lose 
all of your customers' data. And so I think Sony and Target both described the cost of their immense hacking as not material in their financial statements because it doesn't matter to them. It's too bad that they lost it. So I do think that just the simple act of there being a penalty for this losing of data would make a huge strides. All right, I'm gonna go back one step before you lose your data. I think one thing I'd like to see, largely from the government, but definitely in collaboration with industry, would be some really good data on which of the various security solutions on the market really have an impact on protecting data so that when the companies out there that don't have huge numbers of resources and team members to devote to security are trying to decide how to invest, they can turn to something not NIST 853, which has hundreds and hundreds of security controls, but a shorter list that says, we've tested these, we know they really work, here's what you should be doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would probably go mad with my moderator bestowed godlike powers, um, and so I would probably just end mass surveillance. I think that the social damage probably outweighs the sort of portrayed public good. I don't, we, we haven't really seen a lot of really positive outcome. Like we, we already have the world's most impressive and advanced intelligence apparatus that has ever been built. And you know, Orlando, San Bernardino, this, this still occurs. And it's not because these people are sophisticated actors. It's because they have ill will and access to firearms. If I were queen for a day, I would say to the security community in cyberspace, put your wands away. Wands away. There's no more magic here. The answer to your question is there are, there are 20 basic controls, the top four of which will prevent 80 to 90% of the problems we are seeing in cyberspace. We're not doing them. Are we all really, do we all really need to become our own pathologists? I'm not my own dentist. You know, I brush, I floss. I used to ask audiences this. I don't know. <laughs> you know, we all brush, we all floss. We visit the dentist twice a year. Right? Why? Because it prevents 80 to 90% of the things known to cause cavities. You can manage your oral hygiene by root canal. I don't recommend it. The top critical security <laughs> controls are the answer here. If I could wave a wand, that's what I'd do. OK, let's give uh, a round of applause for our panelists. I hope you know a little bit more about the subject. Um, Jeff, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much. Thank you. Discussion uh, of the balance between transparency, privacy, and trust. I love the lightning round where you heard uh, proposals ranging from ending mass surveillance to increasing due process. And uh, it was uh, an illuminating and nuanced discussion in every respect. We are going to end in the spirit of our deep dive with a deep dive into at least one case study of the government's efforts to get access to data, both here and abroad. And we just have this dazzling constellation of thinkers uh, to discuss it. So I'm looking forward to this final round uh, as one that will yield an answer to the question, under what circumstances should the government be able to get access to emails, geolocational data, and all of the information about ourselves that we store on these devices and in the digital cloud? Uh, we are uh, going to begin, I'll, I'll, let me introduce our panelists to give you a sense of what's in store for you. So uh, being mic'd uh, on the left is John Palmer. He is Associate General Counsel of Microsoft. I'm sure he was delighted not to be in, uh, included in that GAFA. GAFAM would be much more menacing. Uh, but uh, that may be because uh, Microsoft has sued the government at least four times on behalf of consumer privacy over the past couple of years. And he is going to tell us more about those suits and what the stakes are. And uh, sitting next to him is Jeffrey Stone of the University of Chicago, the leading First Amendment commentator of our time, who also, among his many achievements, served on a president's council to rethink the balance between privacy and security in light of the Snowden re revelations. Sitting next to him is the great Neil Katyal, uh, 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 professor of law at Georgetown University, uh, distinguished Supreme Court advocate at Hogan Lovells, former acting Solicitor General of the United States, and most importantly of all, my brother-in-law. And those of you who have been here before know that we are a tag team who are going to go on the road and start up a great new show on the Constitution called Brothers in Law. And this is part of that 
exciting educational enterprise. And sitting next to him is my law school teacher and the greatest thinker about cyberspace in America, Larry Lessig of Harvard Law School, uh, foe of corruption, scholar of the internet, and really the best person available to help us think through what the rules should be. So John, I want to start off. You, there have been a bunch of cases against the government, as I said. Several of them have involved challenges to the secrecy of the orders by which the government issues uh, to Microsoft to turn over data. But let's begin with the case from 2014 where Microsoft objected that it shouldn't have to turn over emails that were stored in third-party servers located in Ireland, first because it said it would violate foreign policy, and also because it said that the consumers own the email. It's their property. Tell us what the legal arguments there were and why you think it should win. Sure. So the background of this is, uh, as many of you know, Microsoft uh, is in the business of providing cloud services and storing data that is often personal, private, uh, and notwithstanding uh, some of the comments in the last uh, session, I think there has been, to the extent there's been a breakdown in trust, that may be true, but the fact remains, most of us entrust vast amounts of data to cloud providers. That's the world we live in. And uh, Microsoft pushes back on the government when we think uh, it goes too far. So this case involved a warrant uh, that was served out of the Southern District of New York, and uh, it, it turned out that the warrants sought uh, email communications, actual communication content that were in our Irish data center and only in our Irish data center. Uh, so we uh, pushed back and, and opposed the warrant on the basis that uh, not only the warrant in, itself stopped at the U.S. border and had no extraterritorial reach, but the, the statutory authority of the government to reach that content uh, on foreign soil, uh, uh, the statute itself did not provide uh, that extraterritorial power. And I think the interesting thing about the case uh, is the way it shook out. Our argument was uh, obviously that you are, uh, in, by doing this, conscripting Microsoft in a way to execute a law enforcement function on foreign soil. And that is, therefore, foreign conduct, extraterritorial activity, statute doesn't allow it, and we win. To get around that argument, the government <clears throat> took the position that no, 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 this is not private data, personal data owned by the user, by the customer. In fact, uh, this is really akin to Microsoft's own business records. And with the argument that this is more akin to Microsoft's business records, government could make the argument under a line of, of cases that uh, Microsoft is under an independent duty to produce its own records no matter where in the world they may be. And that, that certainly is a, a line of law that exists. And that really teed up the issue uh, that I think is critical and that you asked about here and, and that, 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 that we spent much of the last panel on, which is, uh, you know, who owns this data? And uh, is it by, by, by voluntarily turning it over to a cloud provider, are you, uh, in essence, saying, okay, now these are your business records, or do you retain control and ownership? So that's up in the Second Circuit now, and we still don't have a decision. It was argued last September, so any day. Great. Well, not necessarily great, but very interesting. <laughs> Okay, so you have three of the greatest thinkers on privacy in the Fourth Amendment in America. I can't wait to hear from them. Well, we're, let's solve this problem. And what I, Jeff, and what I want to ask, as, as John described it, much of this dilemma comes from these odd doctrines, one of which were, the Supreme Court has said, if I surrender data to a third party like Microsoft, I abandon all expectation of privacy in it. That's called the third party doctrine. But as Justice Sonia Sotomayor said in a recent Supreme Court case, if that is taken seriously, that means we all have no privacy today because all of us store all of our data, not in locked desk drawers like at the time of the founding, but in the digital cloud. You served on the President's Commission. You had criticisms of mass surveillance. I, mean, I think I'm going to ask very specifically, what, what do you think the best alternative to the third party doctrine is? And should Microsoft have to turn over the data, both if it's stored in the United States and abroad? So it's important to understand the origins of the third party doctrine. Um, until 1967, uh, the basic understanding of the Fourth Amendment was that a search under the Fourth Amendment um, consisted of a physical intrusion 
into a physical space uh, owned or controlled by the person who was the target of the search. So if the government searched your house or searched your car or searched your briefcase or searched your pocket or your mail, uh, they were entering into a physical space and that was a search. And the court had held uh, 40 years earlier that wiretapping was not a search, it was not governed by the Fourth Amendment because in a wiretap the government is not entering into a physical space owned and operated by the person who's being wiretapped. They're, they're going into a, a, a wire that's outside the home and it's just not covered by the Fourth Amendment. So in 1967, the court, after 40 years of, of, of clearly being wrong, uh, came around to the view that, that that traditional understanding no longer is acceptable. But we have to figure out a way to go beyond that and to bring wiretapping under the Fourth Amendment. And so they said, okay, the individual um, is protected in, in, in his privacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis searches if the government um, intrudes upon reasonable expectations of privacy. So it's no longer a physical intrusion into a physical place. It's does the individual have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And at the wiretap, the court said, uh, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your phone calls the same way you do in your mail. And therefore, even though there's no physical intrusion, it's a search. OK, then the problem is, well, what else is a reasonable expectation of privacy? Suppose I give a speech in a public park. Um, can the government ask somebody who was there, what did Stone say? And I say, well, that's, that violates my privacy. And obviously, it's not private. It was public. I mean, it's a speech that everybody could hear. And the court said, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy there. Therefore, you can compel somebody to, to testify as to what you said. That gave rise to the third party doctrine. Basically, the notion was that if you turn over information to a third party, you no longer have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And therefore, there's no search. And the question is, does that doctrine still make sense in a world of the, of the, with the technology that we have today um, in the way it did when it was first put in place. Great, that's a very helpful summary. We understand how we got here. Neil, you, among your many achievements, filed a brief in the Apple case, which cast some light in it. This is a really hard question I'm asking these uh, uh, panelists, so, uh, but I'll ask you, do you have an alternative to the third party doctrine in the age of cyberspace? So, uh, you know, I represented all the major tech companies outside of Apple uh, who, uh, in the case uh, in San Bernardino. And I think from understanding what's going on there, basically there's two ways of protecting privacy. One is what Jeff's talking about, which is constitutional. What's the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures say? The other, as was discussed before, is almost statutory. What are con what's Congress doing? What's it saying about the rules under which data can be accessed by the government? Um, and these are both bitterly debated on the Supreme Court and in the halls of Congress. And um, you know, it seemed the position that the tech companies took in the case is this is really, really hard. And the last thing we should do is either give it up to judges in terms of just kind of amorphous Fourth Amendment standards, or as the government was doing in the San Bernardino, relying on a statute from 1789 to get authorization to, you, to, for, to force Apple to write software to break its encryption. Here's what the statute says. It says that um, the Supreme Court and all courts established by act of Congress may issue all writs necessary or appropriate in aid of their respective jurisdictions. If you think that's talking about breaking into an iPhone, you know, I got a bridge to sell you. So, I mean, you know, this statute was written 100 years before the light bulb was created, okay? And that's what the government was resting on for its authorization to come in and, uh, and, break, and force Apple to break the phone. So I think the solution here is actually not something that we can solve in this half hour. I think the solution is a democratic debate in Congress because these are, these, the questions about privacy and security, and I do think they ultimately trade off, I don't think you can always have both, um, are really hard and uh, I don't think conducive to trying to tease out some word in either the Fourth Amendment or in the 1789 statute. Great. Okay, Larry, it's all up to you because both Jeff and Neil gave, Jeff gave us really helpful background about how we got here. Neil explained the Apple case and said Congress has to solve it. I think you have to solve it because because <laughs> John needs an answer and so does the nation. I'll just throw this on the table. You know, I'm all Brandeis all the time. Whenever I have a hard question, I ask WWBD, what would Brandeis do? And in that great dissent in the wiretapping case, he basically said, a search that reveals a huge amount of private information about us, like wiretaps in the 1920s, is unconstitutional even with a warrant, because the framers of the Constitution were, fought the American Revolution over broad searches without individualized suspicion that could reveal a lot of private information. 
Uh, do you agree or not? Or what's your alternative? Well, I'm not going to disagree with Brandeis sitting so close to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're, you're but, his but heir. I actually, think, I actually think we've got to unpack a subtlety in this case, which is really important to understand why the issue was so critical. Um, it's not just that the government was asking Apple to crack a phone and reveal the information that was on the phone. The government was asking Apple to produce software that would make it easy for Apple to crack, to, for the government to crack the phone. And the reason for that is the government can crack the phones right now. They go out to the private market, they pay a million dollars to hackers who develop these ways around the phone, and they, and they crack the phone. It's expensive. They don't want to do that. They instead want to co-opt um, uh, others to make it easier for them to be cracking those phones. And this is a really hard question that I don't think there's any clear answer to, and I don't even think Brandeis has a clear answer to it. Because on the one hand, you say, look, in the project of making it easier for us to enforce the law, it's completely appropriate for the government to work with private industry to make it easier for us to do the stuff that enforces the law. And if that means making it so we can unlock phones when we have a warrant, you know, I'm all for the standards uh, being very high, um, then there's nothing wrong with saying to Apple they ought to make this kind of software for us. But on the other side, from Apple's perspective, from the industry's perspective, the last thing in the world they want is the public to perceive them as cooperating with the people who are going to unlock phones to make it easier to get a divorce from the husband who's been cheating on the, on the, on the spouse. Right? So, so there's this conflict here that we don't actually have an answer, I think, in the past to translate or to or to enforce, and this is why I think um, Neil's uh, ultimate point is really very powerful. We have to have an informed debate about what the values are we're going to embrace. Um, and that informed debate um, has got to happen with a lot more understanding about the plasticity of these architectures of technology. I mean, right now, there's no basic understanding, certainly among congressmen, um, but in the public generally, about you know actually how complicated the trade-offs are, the potential to build a technology that would be much more protective and also more uh, uh, secure, well, offer the government more security is there, and we just need to advance that understanding. And, and that seems to me the, big, the biggest gap. So I'm number three evading your question, and um, <laughs> I'm sticking to the evasion. Wow, I'm actually crushed <laughs> because Larry Lessig is the leading theorist in America of challenging Americans to translate the values of the Constitution into a technological age. And I'm not going to let you off the hook with evading it because if you can't solve it, anyone is. Just fair warning for the lightning round, I'm going to ask all of you if you had to come up with an alternative to the current rules about access to mass data, what would it be? So you got a little more time to think about it. After the Democratic debate and after the Congress people who you don't think are ready for it, they're going to look for some guidance. John, you have a second series of cases, which are also really important that I want to talk about. And they involve transparency, another obsession of Louis Brandeis, who said that sunlight is the best of disinfectants. And in at least three cases, Microsoft has argued that secret orders that prohibit it from disclosing uh, demands that it uh, turn over data violate the First Amendment and other parts of the Constitution. Tell us about those cases and why you think you should win them. Sure. I mentioned the statute, the statutory authority before, and Neil picked up on that. And it, 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 it's, it's, it's also old. It's not as old as the All Writs Act. But 1986 is ages ago in, in, in technology years. And that's when that statute was enacted. So we do need a debate. Absolutely, Microsoft embraces that, uh, that really updates and and takes care of the lag in the law. Um, that same statute provides uh, law enforcement with the right uh, to seek uh, data, customer data, and when doing so, to obtain a secrecy order, essentially a non-disclosure order. And uh, just a little bit of background on this case, when we looked at our numbers, and it, it is important to note that we don't want to overstate the issue here. The, the, the number of, of, of demands for data from customers represents still, it affects a, a, a tiny fraction of 1%, a fraction of 1% of our, of our customer base. So this is not a situation where um, you know, 50% of our customer, ba customer base is 
uh, subject to these type of access requests. So you have to put, put it in that type of, of context. But nevertheless, uh, the, the law enforcement has, an, has a right to obtain a secrecy order. When we looked at our numbers over the last 20 uh, months or so, um, uh, it's clear that of those demands, more, the majority of them are accompanied by a secrecy order. And here is the more troubling thing. Of those secrecy orders, the vast majority of them have no end date. Uh, they're indefinite. Uh, and so we, we're challenging that practice and we're challenging the statute to, to the extent that it allows that practice of obtaining those secrecy orders without uh, any case specific showing that such a secrecy order, certainly of indefinite duration, is, uh, is merited. And that, that case is, is in its infancy. We just filed it uh, in, in Seattle. Uh, and um, it has not been briefed yet. We're at the early stages. Is it a First Amendment challenge or a statutory? It's a, yes. Uh, it, so we're challenging on two grounds. It's a, we're challenging it under the First Amendment because it's a restraint on Microsoft's speech, right? These orders say to Microsoft, you can't tell your customer that law enforcement has sought uh, your data. We can't tell anybody. Um, so it's a restraint on, on Microsoft's First, first uh, Amendment rights, but we're also challenging it uh, under the Fourth Amendment that customers uh, have a Fourth Amendment right to receive, to learn at some point that the government has invaded their privacy. And uh, the current regime we have uh, allows for that right never to be realized. This is so interesting. I, all, I want all of you to weigh in. We might as well go in order. Jeff, you were on the President's Commission. I know you think there's some value to not telling suspects that they're being surveilled in advance, but what, what do you... I, I, sh I should say that we're not taking an absolutist position here at all. I mean, there, there clearly are circumstances where covert investigations are necessary, uh, but they ought to be the exception. They ought not be the rules, specifically when you, when you talk about the duration. Great. So the question on the table, another hugely important one, is under what circumstances should the government be able to engage in these secret uh, searches that forbid the companies from disclosing that they occur? So uh, the, to understand the reason for the secrecy, of course, it's that if you're investigating an individual as, let's say, a potential terrorist, um, you don't necessarily want them to know they're under investigation for all sorts of obvious reasons. You're trying to figure out who they're talking to, who they know, um, what the network is, and you don't want to alert them to the fact that you're in the process of investigating them. So it, it's perfectly sensible for the government to want these secrecy orders. Uh, and I think they're perfectly legitimate if they are properly limited. And as suggested, the two clear limitations have to be, they have to be justified by some appropriate standard of showing that secrecy is warranted in this particular case. And they have to have durations where you need renewal if in fact there's a the duration that was initially authorized uh, was inadequate. Those are simple statutory solutions. And that's what's needed is a statute. On the President's Review Group, group on which I, I worked, one of our recommendations uh, was precisely this, that particularly for national security letters, which the FBI uses, um, that they should not be able to issue security orders, uh, secrecy orders, um, without a court order, and that these should have durational limitations. And to our disappointment, uh, this was rejected by the President. Um, the, the FBI basically persuaded the, the administration that it needed a free hand here. Um, and on that, I d disagree emphatically. I, I can see no rational reason why there should not be judicial review of these orders and why there shouldn't be statutory limitations on them. Fascinating. Neil. Well, it's nice that Microsoft's bringing the case and that Jeff has faith in the courts in this, having litigated for the government and against the government in these transparency cases. I don't think that the courts are going to solve this problem um, at all. Um, and that's because there's just so much deference in the courts when the government comes in and says national security. And it is very hard to get a transparency order uh, in the wake of that for the weighty reasons that Jeff was adverting to uh, at the beginning of, uh, of his remarks. Um, so what could you do? Well, I think one thing you could do, and uh, you know, I have an op-ed tomorrow in the New York Times about this, is uh, if you look at what happens in the State Department when they have dissent, they have something called the dissent channel, and it's institutionalized. So any bureaucrat, any State Department official anywhere in the world can write a cable 
to their uh, to the elite State Department Office of Policy Planning and say, hey, this is wrong. And that's what happened a couple weeks ago in Syria when a bunch of their, our diplomats protested. And can you build something like that in? Because I think one of the big fears right now with national security letters and all that is it's so easy for the government, A, to make the request to Microsoft, and then B, to say, oh, and nobody can talk about it. I mean, it creates all sorts of perverse incentives. So I think you should be, we should be standing up inside the executive branch. Whenever anyone wants to make a secrecy request, there's got to be a kind of dedicated unit to argue internally against that. And we may not see it all in the you know, public, uh, but at least try to create standing institutions to argue against what is otherwise their natural inclination, which is to say, oh, let's just keep all this stuff secret and nobody can talk about it. And this is what, by the way, was done with the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, because one of the recommendations we made, which was adopted, is that there would be a privacy and civil liberties advocate for the first time who would be able to argue <laughs> against the government's demands and requests so there would be an adversary process. And I agree, it should extend to these situations as well. Larry, I can't wait to hear your thoughts. And among your many provocative pieces, one I remember distinctly was called Against Transparency, written in the New Republic a while ago, suggesting that there may be limits in democracy to having everything public. Uh, what do you feel about secret orders to disclose data? And uh, should transparency operate differently in different contexts? Well, um, I'm going to bracket my New Republic piece because it wasn't really doesn't fit. It's and I only you're not going to give me the 20 minutes it would take to explain it. Um, um, but I, I, I think, afterward, afterward. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I I think that the the frame we ought to adopt in thinking about this is what's the expected game that gets played out if the government engages in overreaching behavior that's perceived by the public not to be trustworthy. Um, and the game is technology companies make it increasingly difficult for the government to actually get what they want. And that brings up the question again, can the government force technology companies to architect their technology so the government can always get access to the data the government wants? But right now, we're seeing with, uh, you know, with Apple's response to how they're going to uh, build their phones, um, uh, the response of technology companies is fine. We're just going to make it so we can't give it to you. We can't actually make it accessible to you. And, and there's going to be a huge fight to imagine Congress passing laws that force technology companies to make um, the technology so that the government can, can break into it, even if that is ultimately, in some sense, the right decision. This is why I think it's so important for the government to take the lead in behaving in a way that strikes people as reasonable and sensible so that it doesn't build this counter reaction in the private community um, and, and force this conflict that I think in the end the government can't win. Larry, what do you mean by that though? I mean, there's obviously there's you know, use, so are they abusing the data in some way? And you know, Snowden's revelations showed, I think, you know, it wasn't much abuse of the actual underlying data, but just the collection alone, I think, really scares a lot of people. That's right, and the collection and not taking steps to signal how they will be uh, safer or more comprehensive in their assurance of safety, relying on law alone. Like I think you, know, you and I have written about how technology architecture itself could be a layer of protection that the government begins to take a lead on talking about how this is going to make it um, so we don't have to fear the government's intervention anymore. I think there's a real campaign the government's got to launch, which is more than just um, we're making the world safe from terrorists. It's also we are taking steps to make sure that we are not invading or um, uh, engaging in behavior which is violating privacy. Because if they don't, the architecture will evolve in a place that makes it even more difficult for the government to have anything that they can do. Great. Well, we're going to set up our lightning round in a sec. But John, I want you to offer closing thoughts about why is it that Microsoft has become such a champion of privacy? Do you find that there is a consumer demand for it? I've been in the privacy trenches for many years. And uh, you know it's rare for companies to make privacy a priority. What has the response been? And why do you think it's important for the rules to protect consumer privacy? I mean. I, I think there's just a reality in the cloud environment now, it's an artifact of where we are, that, that technology intermediaries are often the only ones who actually can make these arguments on behalf of customers. They can't vindicate their own rights. The person who has the Irish uh, email account can't vindicate his or her own rights, and, in, in, and the, the people who are, whose data has been uh, obtained under secrecy have no knowledge of it, so they have no way to vindicate their rights. And so there is a strange uh, 
part of American history un uh, unfolding here where technology companies actually are the only ones who can do that. Um, of course, it's in our interest to do that. Uh, we talked a lot about trust. It's vital to our business and it's vital to, I would suggest, you know, the entire American technology sector and, in fact, American business who, and enterprise and government who are all putting their most confidential material and their most private material in the cloud, it's vital that we have trust in that system, that that system has integrity, has security, has, has some degree of transparency, maintains privacy, absolutely vital. It's vital to our business, absolutely. I think it should be vital as a policy matter across the board. So um, that's why we do it. Wonderful, thank you for doing it. Here's the, here's the lightning round, gentlemen, uh, 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 like it or not. Under what circumstances should the government be able to get access to all of the emails on my cell phone? What should they need in order to search all the emails? You go first? Yeah. Probable cause and a warrant. No matter what the, co no matter what the crime, I'm suspected of uh, a traffic offense or something like that, you can get all my emails with probable cause and a warrant? All, all your emails? If it's possible to target certain emails realistically, then they should be more targeted. I don't know if that's technologically possible, but I assume by using words or something, you can probably do that. And obviously, it should be done reasonably, which means if you can get access to only the emails that are really relevant, that should be the requirement. Great. Neil? So I would give you a procedural answer, not a substantive one. So I would get rid of all of the laws that currently exist. I don't know what probable cause means or when warrants are issued. I don't think courts do very well either. But in, but CALEA and ECPA and all these old statutes, I'd get rid of them all, say they're going to sunset in a year, force a democratic debate on all this stuff. And in the course of that democratic debate, I think we have to take really seriously what you just heard from Microsoft because, you know, one, the, you know I could have, under, when I was doing the San Bernardino case, I totally understood why the government was doing what it was doing. It, I, you know, made a lot of sense to me, you know, there are arguments on both sides, you know, there's no problem with that. But when they came into the court and said, this is a marketing ploy on behalf of the tech companies, and that's what's at stake, I thought that was, you know, so corrosive to what this debate has to be. I think we have to have a democratic debate, and it's got to be understood that both sides are approaching this in good faith. Larry, last word to you. So I'm uh, more with my teacher, Jeff. Um, I think, um, I think it precisely is the test. I, I, I concede we don't have a good sense in the courts about how it's going to be implemented, but we've got to build a procedure, a much more reliable procedure to test these for every single type of, uh, there's got to be an independent test for every single type of invasion here, and um, I'm happy to force that as part of the democratic debate, but I think that's got to be the baseline. What you want is for me to say it, it can, it's good for uh, terrorism, but not good for your divorce action. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, that's, I think, built into what Jeff is talking about is a better sensitivity about reasonableness. Like, what is the real government need here? And the government's got to have a really strong uh, argument. Um, all of that is separate from what happened in Apple, though, which is about forcing Apple to write technology that would, go, uh, would be used in a, general, a more general way. Wow. Well, this has been extraordinarily illuminating. When I was in law school, uh, Larry Lessig uh, taught me that it is possible to strike thoughtful democratic balances between privacy and security. What matters is the values that drive the designer and the nature of the democratic debate. And I think it's been hugely helpful to hear from the companies, from Monica and John, and learn about how the government is working together with Facebook to promote ca uh, counter speech and what each of them are doing, uh, to hear from that incredible group of technologists, uh, hackers, privacy advocates, and government officials, and then what Microsoft is doing and from these scholars. Ultimately, though, you've learned that the takeaway is, is up to you. There is going to have to be a democratic debate. That means you have to educate yourself about these issues. And one place, as always, to begin, read the Constitution. Go to the Constitution website, uh, <laughs> constitutioncenter.org. You will find the top liberal and conservative scholars in America debating what they agree and disagree about the Fourth and First Amendment and everything else we've been discussing. Please join me in thanking our superb panelists.